Good morning once again, everyone. I encourage you to take your Bibles out and turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 26. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 26. That'll be our text today. And if you didn't have a Bible with you, there are Bibles underneath the seats in front of you, and you can take one of those out. And if you do not have a Bible, or you know someone that doesn't have a Bible, go ahead and take one of our pew Bibles there and offer it as a gift to them, or it's our gift to you if you need a Bible. So the 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 to the end of the chapter, verses 31 there, is where we're at. Are you about glorifying yourself, or are you about glorifying God? Are you about glorifying yourself or God in everything you say or do in your life? Just recently, a non-Christian author said this, and I thought it was very interesting for someone that's not a Christian. Accomplishments don't erase shame, hatred, Cruelty, silence, ignorance, low self-esteem, or immorality. It covers it up with a creative version of pride and ego. And that was a non-Christian that said that. Well, pride causes a lot of things to go bad in life. Pride causes the wicked to lie about the righteous Psalm 59, 12 says, For the sin of their mouths, the words of their lips, let them be trapped in their pride. He's talking about lying there. A person who's proud is going to lie about others and even about themselves in time. They'll be be trapped in their pride. They'll get caught in their own lies. Now, a person will usually lie to do what? Well, they usually lie to make themselves look better and to make others look worse than themselves. There's also in pride a bent towards violence, as Scripture says in Psalm 73, 6. Pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. Jesus actually gives a list of all of the junky, depravity stuff of man, and he mentions it like this, from Within, out of the heart of man, comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these things come from within and they defile a person. If you want to look that up, go ahead and jot this down. Mark 7, verses 21 through 23. Pride, I find interesting there, is mentioned by Jesus in the same breath as sexual immorality, adultery, deceit, sensuality, slander. Pride just comes out in the same sentence. The Apostle John indicates, For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father but from the world. That's in 1 John chapter 2. We just studied that just recently on Thursday nights. The desires of the flesh, everyone, as it says in the Bible, what it's defining there is the desires of the flesh are self-centered, pride-filled passions. This church in Corinth had a tendency to be puffed up with pride, and we'll see that in chapter 4 and verses 6 and 18 through 19 and in chapter 5. But we need to contrast that with the gospel of God's grace. It, It leaves no room for boasting. God is not impressed with your looks, everyone. I mean, some of some of you look really great this morning. Okay, all of you look great this morning. Thank you, right? But as we know as believers, God looks within. He's not impressed with our looks, our social position, our achievements, our, our background, our financial status. Eh. 
in this section of scripture that we're going to read, just in the first verse of what we're going to look at today, if you want to look there with me in verse 26, for consider your calling, brothers, that there were not many wise according to the flesh. I'll read the rest of it in a second, but Paul writes the word many, not any. And so what we see, and that's a key word in there, because what Paul's letting us know is that people from all backgrounds and all abilities and all social economic statuses are involved in this. But in the New Testament, we do meet some believers with high social standing, but Jesus makes it very clear. It is really tough with, for people that have a lot of resources to, to rely on him. There's not many of them, but there are some. And this description that Paul gives of the converts that were actually there is not a real flattering one. Because he says there in verse 26, there were not many of you wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. So Paul makes it really clear, hey, there's not a lot of people running around in your church there in Corinth. When Corinth, once again, was a, was a thriving metropolis of trade and had some very wealthy people in there. And, and Paul's like, hey, not, not many of you were wise or mighty or noble. And what he's getting at is that God called them not because of what they were, but in spite of what they were. Jesus said this in Matthew 11, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. So guess what? This church in Corinth was comprised primarily of just ordinary, terrible sinners. People. And you have Paul who... Oddly enough, before his conversion, was very self-righteous, was, was considered, you know, he had all of the degrees and he let people know that. If anyone has any room to boast, I could do it. And he, you know, he let people know he had all the right degrees, he had all of the right teachers, he had the right mentors, but guess what? He had to give that up in order to go to heaven. Now, the people he was talking to for the most part, and I think this, you gotta, gotta picture this. So you have Paul who had to give up all of that to serve the Lord, and he's talking to people that never had that. The other end of the spectrum, those that thought they were too sinful, and actually all of us are too sinful for God to have a relationship with in our sin. But he's letting them know you are not too sinful for God to reach you. You are not too sinful for God to save you. And that's what he launches into in verse 27. He's like, you were, you were yucky sinners. But then in verse 27, but God. And really when we see this phrase, but God here, this should be all of us in the stadium, all of a sudden, the batter hits the bat, and you know that that ball is going 490 feet. And everyone in the stadium, it's baseball season, so I have to use baseball analogies. Everyone in the stadium, as soon as that's hit, it is a no-brainer. It is a no-doubter. That ball is hit, and you know it's out. It's just a matter of, is, is it out of the stadium or not? And that's what Paul's getting us here in this type of excitement. He's saying, all of you are, are weak and sinners and you don't deserve God's grace, but God, it's like, whack! But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong and the base things of the world and the despair 
and the despised God has chosen the things that are not so that he may abolish the things that are so that no flesh may boast before God. So God chooses the foolish and the weak and the base, as it says, says there. And so just so you know, that means lowly born. The despised. He chooses them to show this proud world that they live in and the proud world that we live in that, you know what, everyone, you need my grace. You, you need my forgiveness. Romans 8 says it very clearly, because those who he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, so that he may be the firstborn among many brothers. And those who he predestined, he called. And those whom he called, he justified. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. You know, what, what's interesting is that this lost world admires birth and social status and financial success and power and recognition, but none of those are any guarantee at all for eternal life. It's only the calling of God. The ones that He calls, that He justifies, that He glorifies. Nothing that we can do. James says in James chapter 2, listen, my beloved brothers, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? Job, who had it all and then lost it all, was a righteous man. Job found out, you know, he shows in verse 19 of chapter 34, God shows no partiality to princes, nor recognizes the rich above the poor, for they are all the work of his hands. You see, the message and the miracle of God's grace through Jesus Christ confounds, puts to shame the high and mighty people of this world that think they got it all figured out. The wise of this world, jump online and you will see this, the wise of this world cannot understand how God changes sinners into saints. The, the mighty of this world are helpless to duplicate this miracle. You can see it in our cities. Many of the people that are leaders within the major cities that, that we live in around here are trying to change people in their own power from people that are weak and hurting to something different, and it confounds them that what it does, it's not working. Drive down any road, and you can tell it's not working. It confounds them. They cannot duplicate God's work. So God's foolishness confounds the wise. God's weakness confounds the mighty. And I'm here to tell you, everyone, from the bottom of my heart, the annals of church history are filled with the accounts of great sinners whose lives were transformed by the power of the gospel, period. In my own time in ministry... As in the ministry of most pastors and preachers, I have seen amazing things take place. Amazing things that life coaches can't duplicate, that counselors cannot understand. I, I have seen delinquent teenagers become successful young adults incredible citizens. I have seen children grow up in the Lord and do incredible things. 
I have seen marriages restored. I have seen homes reclaimed, much to the amazement of the court system, much to the amazement of the lawyers that were trying to get a few dollars for a new divorce settlement. Transformed by the power of the gospel. And that's what Paul's saying here. God reveals the foolishness and the weakness of this present world system by who he is. Salvation is holy of God's grace. That's it. And if it's not of God's grace, and that's it, if it's not just that, then God can't get the glory. It is this truth that Paul wants to get across to the Corinthians here because they were guilty of glorifying men, as we had said last week. If, if we glorify people, and even godly people like, like Peter and Paul and Apollos, very godly people, if we glorify those people, we're robbing God of the glory that He alone deserves. And it was the sinful attitude of pride that was helping to cause the division that was in the church there. And Paul is simply saying to them, as we read this, that no one can boast before God and that all we have, everyone, all we have is in Jesus Christ. That's what he jumps into in verse 30. But by his doing, here's another hit, whack, another home run. By his doing, you are in Christ Jesus. I think that's kind of a big statement. Wouldn't you agree? Can you do anything to be with God? No. In your own power, you can't get across the gap between sinful man and a perfect God. You can never do it. You can try all you want. It's not going to work. But by His doing, by providing the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, by His doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption so that just as it is written let him who boasts boast in the Lord every believer no matter what the background you see how this works every believer no matter what your background you are in Christ and you have all that you ever need you are complete you are the same as another believer. When you compare yourself to another that is a believer, you are complete like they are complete. We are God's people. It's the Lord who's done it all. He gets the glory. The spiritual blessings that we need are all in the person of Jesus Christ. It says there. That's, that's what he's getting at. He's our wisdom, first of all. You read that there? He became to us wisdom. In Colossians 2, Paul says it this way, so that their hearts may be encouraged, having been held together in love, even until all the wealth of the full assurance of understanding, unto the full knowledge of God's mystery, that is Christ himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. How much wisdom and knowledge is hidden in him? All. All. He is our wisdom. The next thing he says there is he is our righteousness. Paul says in his next letter to the Corinthians in chapter 5 of that letter, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And so we have wisdom in Christ. We have righteousness in Christ. And then it says sanctification. 
John 17, 19, for their sake I sanctify myself that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. We have that sanctification. In him we have redemption. In Romans 3, 24, we are being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. The emphasis in this little section of scripture that we've read here is that God shows his wisdom by means of righteousness, sanctification, and redemption that we have in Christ. And these words, they're kind of theologically deep words, carry special meanings for Christians as a reminder. Righteousness. Righteousness has to do with our standing before God. We are justified. God declares us righteous in Jesus Christ. But we're also sanctified. So that sanctification word, people who are sanctified are born again and therefore part of God's family. They're reserved for God's use, the sanctifying work of the Spirit in their lives. What that sanctification looks like is, as it says in 1 Thessalonians, we, we abstain, for example, from sexual immorality. We, we understand that we've been called to be holy people. To be sanctified, everyone, means that God has been at work in our lives redemption emphasizes the fact that we are set free because jesus christ paid the price he paid the price on the cross and that leads to then the completed redemption when christ returns so i don't know if you noticed this here but one of the things i was looking at this week is that In one sense, we have three tenses of salvation going on here. We have been saved from the penalty of sin, righteousness. We are being saved from the power of sin, that's sanctification. And we shall be saved from the presence of sin in his redemption and glory. And every believer has all of that in Christ. And so this is pretty easy to apply. We give no glory to men. What Paul wants us to do is is understand that he's he's essentially saying, "I, I I don't have anything more than you'd have. You know, what he's what he's saying is, you know, Peter does not have more Jesus than you do. We we glorify God and God alone. And as we review this chapter and as we look at what we've been seeing here, we can see the mistakes that people make, that the Corinthians were making as well, mistakes that help create problems in churches and people's lives. They were not living up to their holy calling. They were instead following the standards of the world. They ignored the fact that they were They were called into this incredible, wonderful spiritual fellowship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ and each other. And instead, they were identifying with human leaders and creating divisions in the church. And instead of glorifying God and His grace and His grace alone, they were they were pleasing themselves with who they had been baptized by and and glorifying men. kind of easy to see that they were a defiled church, a divided church, really a disgraced church. And it really needs to help us examine our own lives, our own church, our own lives. We've been called to be holy. We've been called into a fellowship with one another. We are called to glorify God. And to glorify God is is to honor Him with praise and worship. God is glorious, amen? Amen. He is great, he's magnificent, he is exceptionally grand in his nature and deeds. Psalm 111.3, he's full of splendor and majesty in his work. And when we glorify him and get our eyes off of ourselves and off of man, we acknowledge his greatness and splendor. We praise him for it. When we give him glory as as we are told to do, we direct our praise, our adoration, our thanksgiving, our worship to him who 
is alone worthy. Scripture makes our responsibility to glorify God instead of man evident from cover to cover. What Paul is saying here is just a little snippet of what is evident throughout Scripture. Man, if you want to go over and see something very interesting in this, go to 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verses 17 through 36. It gives us a very specific model for giving glory to God. If you're sitting there today saying, man, okay, I get, I, I shouldn't give glory to man. I need to give glory to God. What what, give me some detail to that, Scott. Give me some meat on the bones for what that looks like. Well, in First Chronicles 16, Asaph is installed as the chief minister before the ark of God, and David instructs him in the method of worship. He says, give praise to the Lord in verse 8 of that section. Proclaim the greatness of God's name. Tell the whole world what God has done. Sing to the Lord. Glory, exalt His name. Rejoice in Him. Seek out the Lord. Trust in His power. Remember all the Lord's mighty deeds. Ascribe glory and strength to Him because it is His due to to ascribe is to think of as belonging or as a quality or a characteristic. We regard the Lord as possessing that glory, possessing that strength. It says to bring an offering to God. And in Asaph's time, the offerings were in accordance with the law of Moses. Today, where it's very clear, we're to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is our Pure, true, proper worship, as it says in Romans 12. Worship the Lord in everything you do in verse 29 of First Chronicles there. Give thanks to God for His goodness and His love. Cry out to God for deliverance. You see, we need to understand what Paul is telling those in Corinth. The Most High God is the possessor of all true majesty. Glory is his by virtue of his nature. He rightly refuses to share it with anyone else. In Isaiah 42, I am the Lord, this is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. By virtue of who God is, we have an obligation to glorify God at all times. Those who refuse to glorify God will face severe judgment as witnessed by the example of Herod, usurping God's glory in Acts 12. If you want a graphic version of, of yuckiness of not giving God the glory and trying to get it for yourself, yeah, take a look. To glorify God, everyone, as Paul is mentioning here, is... is to glorify Him, His attributes, praise His works, trust His name, obey His word. you got to need to remember that He is holy, that He is faithful, that He is merciful, that He is gracious, that He is loving, that He is majestic, that He is sovereign, that He is powerful, and that He is all above everything else. And that's just for starters. His works are wonderful and wise and marvelous and fearfully complex. His word is perfect and trustworthy and right and radiant and pure and firm and precious. And I didn't make that up. Go look at Psalm 19. His salvation is astounding and timely and near. No matter how loud or wide we proclaim the glory of God, He is worthy of more glory. We sang a song today that we've never sung here in the six years that I've now been here. Yet it's probably the second oldest song of the ones we sang today that just simply said 
I love you, Lord. That song has, has a lot of meaning in very simple words. It was the song that was the first song I got to sing after being saved as a kid. So I kind of remember it. Very easy to remember. But it's so rich in its simplicity of worshiping the God that's so complex and over all and in all and through all. You know, I, I love you, Lord. I lift my voice to worship you. My, my soul rejoices in that. He's my king. There's many other songs like that song written in 1875 that many of you may know, To God Be the Glory. Come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give Him the glory, great things He has done. It is very clear what Paul is, is getting at here. But by His doing, you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Don't boast about anything else. Let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Amen? And maybe today you do not know the Lord. This would be a great day to start boasting in him by bowing your knee and saying yes to believing in Him and giving your life to Him. And for those of us who are saved, you can never raise your voice enough to praise His name. Boast in Him. In whatever you do, boast in Him. We can glorify God with words of praise and thanksgiving. We can glorify God through our works of service. Jesus said, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. We need to be bearing fruit for the kingdom of God and that brings glory to Him. And you know what, everyone? Even in our manner of death, we can glorify God. Even in how we die, we can, bring glorify, we can bring glory to Him. Are you, are you living for Him? Are you giving glory to Him and Him alone? Because He is our wisdom, He is our righteousness, He is our sanctification, and He is our redemption. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank You so much for this time together this morning. I thank You for Your Word. I thank You for the very, very clear and concise teaching here from Paul. that you are our wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption in Christ. And we boast in the Lord, not in any person, not in anything, but in him and him alone. We sing and shout and think and do everything in our lives to glorify you because you have saved us. You've given us life. What a joy it is to be your kids. Thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me right now? I want to thank you for being here today. Just a quick reminder, we've got the box in the back there for our prayer requests, for uh, the offer.